What does it take to win a battle? This is a question that has no single answer. Superior firepower, numbers, or training and tactics certainly play a huge part. But throughout history, one factor has proven decisive time and time again. You have to have the drive to succeed, the will to win, and above all, you have to have the determination to push through the greatest of adversity. In today's episode, we're going to look at the incredible story of Master Sergeant Roy Benavides, a man whom history would label as unkillable, despite battling odds that, in any conventional sense, would have seen him perish in the steamy jungles of Vietnam. Today's episode is sponsored by My Heritage. Researching history and the people who have made an impact on this earth makes us wonder, what is our own family's place in history? Well, our partner on today's video, My Heritage, is here to help you answer that question, like it did for us when it helps us find a relative dating back four generations who emigrated from Switzerland and was drafted into World War I at the age of 43. My Heritage is Europe's number one family history app, giving people the power to research their bloodline and explore the fruits of personalized DNA testing. For too long, exploring your family history has been a long and complex task, with very little fun to be had. However, now it's a highly enjoyable activity, utilized by over 9 million subscribers, searching through over 18 billion records and archives to best recreate their family tree. In addition, MyHeritage also sports a top-of-the-line AI technology photo restoration service, there to take your historical photos and old family albums and repair, enhance, and even add color to the old black and white, sepia-saturated memories. The photo tool helped us find old yearbook photographs of our older family members that would otherwise be truly impossible to find. We also love utilizing the Smart Matches feature, which helps us save time and find other family trees with our entire family's information readily available, waiting to join the legacy. You don't even have to be a pro at managing historical archives. The interface is so easy to use, and everything you need to build a successful family tree is already at your disposal. Use the link below and sign up for a 14-day free trial and enjoy all the incredible sleuthing tools MyHeritage has to offer. Best of all, if you decide to continue your subscription, you'll get a 50% discount. You have the power to solve the mystery of where and whom you came from. It is just that easy and enjoyable with MyHeritage. Welcome to Wars of the World. From almost the start, Roy Benavides' life was a story of struggle and strife. Born to parents Salvador and Yaki Benavides on August 5th, 1935, in DeWitt County, Texas, at just two years old, he lost his father when Salvador was struck down by tuberculosis. His mother remarried, but within five years, she too was taken from him by the same disease that killed his father, and both he and his younger brother were then sent to live with his aunt and uncle. Now living in a family of eight children, plus he and his brother, and caring for an elderly grandfather, money was forever a problem in the relatively poor household. And this led to Benavides taking various small jobs around his schooling to shore up the household income, such as shining shoes or working on nearby farms. But this was not enough, and so before he completed his high school education, he dropped out in order to take full-time employment. Not long afterwards, the US was stunned at the news of North Korea invading South Korea, and with the seemingly imminent threat of another global war, this time between the Democratic West and Communist East, the US began a major modernization program. This included an ever greater emphasis on special operations, something that had served the Allies well during the Second World War, and was ideally suited to the growing threat of communist insurgencies in South America, Africa, and Southeast Asia. 
Aged 17 in 1952, Benavidez was attracted to the military life and the respect it still garnered and joined the Texas National Guard, training a handful of days a month while working around his regular jobs for the family. But it was not long before he was drawn into becoming a full-time soldier, transferring to the regular army in 1955. Within a few years, he had not only met and married his wife, but had been transferred to the 82nd Airborne, where his drive and determination got him recognized by his superiors, and his name was soon brought up when it came to candidates for special forces training at Fort Bragg. Now abandoning the famous Green Beret of the US Army Special Operations Forces, by the early 1960s, events in Southeast Asia between the pro-US South Vietnam and the Communist North and their insurgent allies, the Viet Cong, were spiraling out of control. Since 1955, the US had been gradually increasing its support to the South by providing them with advanced American equipment, but in order for them to use this equipment effectively, they needed to be trained, and that meant sending in American advisors. Advisors that often came in the form of special forces. In 1965, Benavidez arrived in South Vietnam for the first time. His mission was to use his extensive experience in special operations to train the South Vietnamese army how to conduct guerrilla warfare against the Viet Cong. While back home, the risk to the advisors was often downplayed to the public. The reality was that the US advisors in Vietnam were every bit as likely to get stuck into the thick of the fighting as the South Vietnamese troops they were supposed to be just training and so were often operating at great danger to themselves. Benavides would learn this firsthand when during a patrol in the dense Vietnamese jungle, he stepped on a landmine, horribly injuring the lower half of his body. Having been evacuated from the scene, it was quickly realized that he needed to be sent back to the United States for treatment, being sent to Fort Sam Houston's hospital in his native Texas. The experienced doctors were less than enthusiastic about his future in the army, and while they tried to remind him that he was lucky to be alive, they told him he would never walk again and would thus be medically discharged. For Roy Benavides, this was not an acceptable option. His doctors may have given up on him, but he was not ready to quit and spent every waking moment focusing on preparing his body to walk again, first trying to wiggle his toes while laying in bed. Once he had accomplished this, he began focusing on ever greater movements of his legs. Then, at night, with few people around to tell him to get into bed, the Special Forces soldier would slide onto the floor and begin crawling as he retrained his body to compensate for his injuries. Through sheer determination and force of will, within a year, the medical staff treating him were astounded to see him on his feet, walking around, and even exercising. Eventually passing the Army's physical requirements for active duty, the soldier who had stepped on a mine and survived, and then been written off as never being able to walk again, could now run in full kit and was allowed to return to his unit. This was not to say that he recovered completely from his injuries. He would suffer bouts of pain for the rest of his life, but the tough Texan would never be beaten by it and pushed through the discomfort with the same zeal that had allowed him to walk again. For many, this story alone would be enough to inspire countless people to overcome great physical adversity. And yet, as incredible as it seems, this is not the story Roy Benavidez is most remembered for. That story comes from when he did something almost totally unthinkable to a rational mind. He went back to Vietnam. It was two years after stepping on the mine that he was sent back to Southeast Asia, just as the war zone erupted with the famous Tet Offensive. Beginning on January 30th, 1968, the offensive aimed to destabilize South Vietnam and weaken American support for the war by engaging in widespread pitched battles across the country, putting enormous strain on Saigon and Washington's forces. The communists believed that the offensive would bring about the collapse of the South Vietnamese government, inspire a popular uprising in support of union with the North, and inflict so many American casualties that the US population would demand an immediate withdrawal of troops. As such, 1968 would see some of the most bitter fighting of the entire conflict. On the morning of May 2nd, 1968, as the Tet Offensive was entering its second phase, which would see a major offensive against Saigon, 
a 12-man Special Forces reconnaissance team was inserted by helicopter into a dense jungle area west of Loch Ninh, just north of the capital. Their objective was to gather intelligence on the strength of North Vietnamese and Viet Cong forces amassing in the region via the famed Ho Chi Minh Trail through Laos and Cambodia from the north. The communists heavily patrolled the area, looking for such an American reconnaissance unit, and it was not long before they came under heavy fire. Realizing they were outnumbered and outgunned, they requested an emergency extraction, but the three helicopters dispatched to collect them couldn't land due to intense enemy fire near the landing zone. Assigned to Detachment B-56 of the 5th Special Forces Group of the South Vietnamese Army, Benavides was monitoring the operation over the radio from a forward operating base in Loc Ninh. The three helicopters sent to recover the reconnaissance team landed at the base to unload wounded crewmen and quickly patch the aircraft up before making another attempt. Benavides volunteered to go back with the aircraft when they made their second attempt, carrying with him medical supplies, as he reasoned that by now, most of them would either be dead or wounded. Instead of attempting to get directly to them, he instead directed the pilot of his helicopter to land in a nearby clearing. With the pilot unable to touch down, Benavides leapt from the hovering chopper with the medical supplies and ran the 75 meters to the reconnaissance team's position, taking heavy enemy fire as he went. He was wounded in the right leg, the face, and head, yet despite his injuries, Benavides pushed on, taking charge of the remaining troops and led them in a fierce firefight to facilitate the landing of the incoming helicopters. Using smoke grenades to guide in the helicopters to the team's position, he continued to be hit by enemy fire, but never wavered and carried or dragged half of the wounded team members to the awaiting chopper. He then provided protective fire by running alongside the aircraft as it moved to pick up the remaining team members, be they dead or alive, including their team leader, with Benavides checking that there were still classified documents on his body as to prevent them from falling into enemy hands. It was then that his luck ran out. While moving to the team leader's body, Benavides was hit again by enemy fire, this time in the abdomen, and this was followed by grenade fragments embedding themselves in his back after one detonated near his position. At almost the same time, the pilot of the helicopter was killed by gunfire, and the aircraft came crashing to earth before overturning on its side. Amazingly, not even this was enough to stop him. He returned to the crashed helicopter, collected the survivors, and again organized a defense of their position, moving around the perimeter, distributing whatever water and ammunition was left to the men. He knew there was no way they could fight their way out given their condition, and so the only thing for it was to either destroy the enemy troops or force them to withdraw with overwhelming US air power. Manning the radio, he guided in US fighter bombers and orbiting gunships to deliver said firepower as close to their position as he dared. With US warplanes providing cover, another helicopter was sent to attempt to extract them, but the enemy seemed just as tenacious as Benavides, with one North Vietnamese soldier getting so close as to be able to club him from behind. The two men proceeded to engage each other in hand-to-hand -hand combat before Benavides put him down and then killed two more enemy soldiers who were rushing the helicopter from an angle that prevented the door gunner from training his M60 machine gun onto them. Despite the legendary effort on his part, his strength was now finally depleted, and he had to be carried onto the aircraft before it lifted off. The whole affair lasted over six hours, during which time Benavides had been in almost constant combat, killing countless enemy troops either directly or indirectly by organizing the team's defense and guiding in airstrikes. During the fighting, he suffered a broken jaw, shrapnel wounds from grenades detonating in close proximity to him, and no less than 37 bullet and bayonet puncture wounds. Weighed against this was the fact that he had saved eight men's lives, recovered dead bodies for burial, and secured intelligence documents that would have been of vital importance to the North Vietnamese. Few would deny that he had done enough to warrant the Medal of Honor, America's highest award for gallantry, but upon seeing his wounds, his commanding officer did not believe he would live long enough to receive it, and so he nominated Benavides for the Distinguished Service Cross instead, because as the second highest award, it would take less time to process. In fact, at one point, a doctor reportedly believed he was dead and tried to close him up in a body bag, when Benavides managed to spit at him to tell him he was still alive. Not for the first time, Benavides defied the odds and survived, and after receiving the medal, 
he was then put forward for the medal he truly deserved, receiving it from President Ronald Reagan in 1981. His citation ended with the words, His fearless personal leadership, tenacious devotion to duty, and extremely valorous actions in the face of overwhelming odds were in keeping with the highest traditions of the military service, and reflect the utmost credit on him and the United States Army. Retiring in 1976, Roy Benavidez returned home to Texas with his wife and three children, contributing to or writing accounts of his experience during the war and overcoming adversity. He also began undertaking speaking tours, particularly to schools and youth groups, where he talked about the importance of education and citizenship, a job he reportedly loved doing. Sadly, he found himself in battle again, this time with diabetes, and it was one he could not win passing away on November 29th, 1998. He is buried at the Fort Sam Houston National Cemetery in San Antonio. Just over a year later, the US Navy began work on logistics ship, the USNS Benavides, named after the unkillable Medal of Honor winner. Then in 2019, it was suggested that the famous Fort Hood be renamed in his honor as Fort Benavides, this coming at a time where there was a growing debate about retraining symbols of the US Confederacy following increased racial tension in the United States, and the Fort Hood name stemming from Confederate General John Bell Hood. The motion was rejected, which led to resentment amongst many Hispanic Americans, who felt that heroes that represented their communities weren't as well remembered in American culture as white ones, even when those were on the wrong side of history. Regardless, Benavidez's name continues to be celebrated by millions of Americans of all ethnicities as the very best of American grit and what can be achieved through sheer determination and force of will. He will forever be the unkillable Roy Benavidez.